All right, the only announcement that I'm aware of, well, I'm going to give two announcements. Number one is that we have deacons meeting this Saturday morning at 830. And the second announcement is that next month the deacons meeting will be on Saturday, June, July 11th, and we will have a special, uh, a special guest speaker on, uh, on July 11th. Also, uh, Charlie Clef is going to be teaching a three-part series on Monday morning starting, the, the, I think he started, no, it starts this next uh, Monday, June 22nd for the next three Monday nights for the Camp Arete Bible study on, uh, on Monday, Monday night. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we begin, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, so we can each make sure that we are in right relationship with the Lord, walking by the Spirit, walking in the light, ready to study the Word of God as God the Holy Spirit will guide and direct our thinking and illuminate our minds to understand the Word of God. So after a few moments of silent prayer, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful that we have this time to come together to focus upon your word, to think about what your word teaches about nations and governments and societies and cultures. Father, we live in a very difficult time in this nation right now. There's a tremendous amount of, of hostility toward one another in different places. There's anger, there's resentment. There are people who, have, who are dominated by their sin nature and just desire to destroy and cre create chaos and disruption. Father, we lack solid leadership as well because so many are just compromised in their own soul and in their own spiritual life, not truly understanding what it means to walk with you and to live a life that is, that is defined by you and that is shaped by their relationship with you. And so, Father, we pray for our nation that there would be a response to the many voices from many pulpits who are proclaiming the truth and teaching about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And yet there are so many today that have hardened their hearts to the gospel and without an understanding of the gospel and biblical truth, there is no foundation for stability in a nation. Help us to understand that and help us to be able to articulate that to those who might have willing, willing ears and open minds. Father, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Our series is entitled, How Should We Then Vote? In this year, we have uh, an extremely important election. I personally think that every election from now until uh, we are taken home to be with the Lord is going to be a critical election. I mentioned this the other night, but I uh, want to develop it a little more tonight. This last Saturday, we had the opportunity to go to the Senate District uh, meeting. Now, in Texas, what happens is when you vote at the primary, which is the first, I think it's the first Tuesday in March, when you vote at the primary that night, 
you have what's called a precinct meeting, and you elect your delegates to go to the Senate district. And those are the, the, the districts for each state senator. At those meetings, you debate and formulate your, the basic uh, platforms or propositions, amendments, things of that nature, that you hope will shape the thinking, the policies, of the, at the state convention. And then you appoint state delegates. Now, most precincts can probably send, especially in, in the Houston area, can probably send 20 or 25. I know my precinct. I, the last time, I don't know what it was this year, if it's changed any, but in 2008, the only other time I did this, the, the precinct could send 26 people. There were 14 of us at the precinct meeting, so we were all automatically, by default, given you know the status of delegates. And that year, if you remember, if you were around, we didn't have Tuesday night Bible class, and I encouraged people to go to their precinct meetings. And there were several people who were live streamers around the state who all went to their precinct meetings, and they all got appointed to go to their Senate district. And I'm hoping more of them got involved and stayed involved because of the Tuesday night thing, I did not cancel that anymore, but um, we should do that. We should emphasize that. We, I, when I went to vote this year, I just said I'd like to go as a delegate. I know that very few people show up or desire to be a delegate, so I'll volunteer, but I can't be here tonight because I have Bible class. And so the precinct chairman was there, and she said, here's a sheet of paper. You're signed up. Give me your name, address, email, phone number and you and your wife can be delegates. So that was as simple as, as it was. And then with the COVID lockdown and everything else, the dates for the Senate district meeting moved around a lot. And it was finally held this last Saturday, Saturday morning. And we attended that and got appointed to be delegates to the state convention, which is going, going to be held here in Houston. And it is possible, but not probable, that we could be appointed to the ne to go as delegates from Texas to the national convention. I have no idea how that works, but there aren't that many people involved. There really aren't. We could take all the members of West Houston Bible Church, Sugarland Bible Church, Grace Bible Church, two or three other solid Bible churches around here, and we could run the table, control the state. We could. I was telling Wayne House about this, and he said that when he was in the late in the late 80s, when he was my prof at Dallas, when I was working on my doctorate, he was the president of the Homeschoolers Association in Texas, and they organized that way. He actually had found a strategy book that the Democrat Party used. And he used that, and he got 10 people from different regions across North Texas and the Panhandle, and each one of them in their regions got, uh, got with 10 people and set up little organizations. And when you set up these little organizations, then when there's a Congress, there's an issue before the state Congress, the state House or Senate, you, write, uh, you can write a letter on the basis of your organization. Now, nobody knows how big your organization is. It might be three people. But it sounds impressive when you have a letterhead and the right name and everything else. He said for about 10 years, they dominated writing the platforms and writing um, you know, the, all of the different policies coming out of North Texas because they were just w well organized. And most people never go to these things. That's a way that believers can influence the culture around, around them. There's not, there's, not only is there nothing wrong with doing that, it is how you fight a war. You get organized, you have a strategy. You know, that's not something for me to organize, but hopefully somebody might get motivated and say, you know, I think I'd like to be involved in doing something like that in, in the future. Because that's part of the responsibilities inherent in being a good citizen in our country. And as Christians, we should all be good citizens. And that, used, that kind of thing used to be taught in schools and emphasized in churches. And it's not anymore, and that's just a sign of the way in which the foundations in this country are crumbling. And that's part of what we're talking about. Tonight we're going to look at the second part of what I began last time, looking at ethics. How do we know 
right from wrong? How do we know truth from error? How do we know justice from injustice? Justice is such a buzzword, and I'll come back in two or three lessons when we get through the first divine institution and talk about social justice and what's involved in that and help us understand how that has become such an important, it's not just a buzzword, it is a deeply embedded uh, idea, a philosophy in the minds of many people. They picked it up because they were brainwashed with it unknowingly, coming up through public school, going to secular universities, this kind of thing became part and parcel of the way they think within their worldview. So tonight we're going to look at the problem of humanity, and as I've done in the previous lessons, we're going to see what the Bible teaches as part of the Judeo-Christian worldview, and then we're going to see what the founding fathers said and thought about, uh, about this issue. So starting with our key verse, Psalm 11.3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? We're looking ultimately at what are the foundations of a healthy, successful, stable, prosperous nation where the people have a measure of contentment and happiness. They are satisfied with their lives. There is limited government to interfere with their lives, and they can live their life according to the dictates of their own conscience. That's part of what it means to have the biblical foundations. And so the question is, if they are destroyed, and there are people who wish to destroy those biblical foundations in our country, the question is, what can the righteous do? And that word for righteousness, which is a word I'll refer to many times tonight, is the Hebrew word tzedakah, which is the noun form for righteousness, and to be righteous is the verb tzedek, or that's also another noun, actually. Tzedek is another form of the noun. And so tzedakah is the quality of the noun, and it means to conform to an ethical or moral standard. So the word implies a standard. Well, the question is, where do we get the standard? Where does that norm come from? Whenever we're talking with somebody, we watch this on the news, we see it here if you're still watching the news or care to watch the news, you hear people say such and such is wrong, it's not fair, it's not just. They're appealing to a standard. Well, the question is, what standard are you appealing to? Where do you get that standard? Is that voted on by people? Is that just assumed to be right or wrong? What's the... What's the foundation for that particular standard? Does it come from within the creation? Is it just sort of, or, or does it come from outside the creation? Coming from within the creation would mean that people set the standard or they vote on the standard or it's some sort of just culturally accepted standard. Sometimes there's no standard that is, is, uh, that's uniform to a culture. This is what happened during the period of the judges in Israel where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's, today we call it moral relativism. That you have your standards, I have my standards, they may be completely opposite, but that's okay. Whatever works for you is great, and whatever works for me is great. You stay out of my business, I'll stay out of your business. Nobody judges each other, and we all do just whatever, uh, whatever we want to, and there's no accountability, there's nothing right, there's nothing wrong, just whatever we prefer to do. Now, that kind of thinking, whether we're looking at an absolute that comes from God, or relative principles that develop within our own preferences or on the basis of a culture, that comes out of a worldview. A worldview is like a set of glasses. It is the way in which we look at the world and think about the world, and it, it, it includes the beliefs that we have that help us to think through and answer problems that we face in life. It is more than just something that's passive. It is a commitment. People are committed to their worldview. 
Just get in an argument with somebody about their worldview, and you'll see how committed they are to it. It, it because it becomes the 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 foundation for anyone's thinking, and everybody has a worldview. And the problem is most people are where have a worldview, and worldview is like a pair of glasses. And if your glasses are on and you see everything clearly, or think you do, then you're not aware that you, you are looking through the glasses. So everybody has a worldview. Sometimes it's examined. Often it's not examined. It's just something that they picked up from their parents, their peers, their professors, and now it's theirs because it seems to work for them. So worldview is comprised of several elements. There's the foundation for all thought, which is their view of ultimate reality. And most people have no idea that the choices they make all day long really come out of their ultimate view of reality. And that in, uh, in philosophy is called metaphysics. But it just means, do you believe that the ultimate reality is just eternal matter and energy, or do you believe it's, it's God? Do you believe it's an impersonal God like the universe? How many times do you hear people say that? Well, the universe didn't like me today. The universe is impersonal. It can't like or dislike. But that's, see, when you get into it, it's, it's irrational. So you start with ultimate reality, and that helps us understand a theory or a view of knowledge. How do we know what we know? How do we understand truth? So when, when somebody makes a statement, and, you know, for example, an ethical statement, well, that's wrong. Well, how do you know that? Well, it's true. So now you're down at the epistemology level. Well, how do you know that's true? Well, it is. Where did it come from? Well, it's just a universal. At that point, nobody wants to talk to you about it. Then you have ethics. That comes out of your knowledge. What is true? What is right? What is wrong? What is good? What is bad? What is just? What is unjust? Then, from your understanding of right and wrong, justice and injustice, you develop your ideas of how to handle the issues that face a city or a state or a nation. We call that politics. And you have all kinds of things that come up in relation to borders, in relation to, um, in relation to things like uh, contracts, real estate law, all of these things that are, are local, running a school system, getting your, uh, getting your water to your house, how that gets done, how your garbage gets picked up. That's really where local politics begins. You get more than 10 or 15 people in the location, you start having, having sort of these, these group problems and you have to decide, okay, what are we gonna do with our trash? Where, where's the electricity going to come from? How are we going to deal with that? Who's going to turn on the internet? All of these kinds of things. And that's part of government. And you face decisions ultimately as to how you're going to face ethical and moral issues. What, what happens when somebody steals from somebody? What are you going to do? Who's going to determine who's guilty? Uh, how are they going to determine who's guilty? What's the penalty going to be? What are you going to do with that person once you uh, discover who it is and you arrest them? All of these questions are part of government. They all flow out of your view of ethics. So all of this is, is important and extremely necess necessary. So as again, I'm calling this a Judeo-Christian worldview among our founders because many of them were, might not have necessarily been Orthodox Christians, but they were all influenced by the Bible. Everybody knew the Bible. Everybody thought in terms of biblical categories. They thought of God as the creator, even if they... Uh, back then, you didn't have Darwinism as an option. You didn't have naturalism developed. You, so you be, everybody believed in some sort of personal transcendent God. They believed the Bible was God's revelation. That was the authority. God revealed himself. They believed the Bible was the inspired word of God. And I've read you quotes from different founding fathers demonstrating that. Uh, they believed God created the human race in his image and in his likeness, both male and female. Fourth, this is the area we're looking at still, sin had corrupted the human race in God's creation. 
And so there was a problem. Now, they didn't all agree on this. Some of them were Arminian and had a different view of sin. Some of them were, most of them were Calvinist or came out of a Calvinist tradition. And they had a different view of sin, but they all understood what sin was, that ultimately this is a violation of God's standard. And ultimately, everyone will be held accountable for their sin in one way or another. Fifth, God had given the human race principles and laws for the right conduct of the human race in light of the fact that we're sinful. And then sixth, God continues to oversee and direct his creation. He's personally involved, and he's directing it towards its perfect, its ultimate end, at which time there will be a judgment and there will be the distribution of rewards and judgment. And we looked at the image of God as God is personal, he's self-conscious, he knows who he is, he exercises will and determination, uh, he's, he's able to think, and he has perfect righteousness and justice, he has morality. It's, all of that is reflected in a finite way in man, and so we're going to come back and review the image of God as we go through this. And the way we think, we ultimately rely upon some one of these systems, either uh, rationalism, trusting ultimately in human reason, empiricism, ultimately trusting in our sense perceptions, mysticism, ultimately trusting in our inner private experience or in intuition or revelation where we are trusting in the objective revelation of God. And so the first two, rationalism and empiricism and revelation, all relate to logic and reason. Mysticism is irrational and non-logical. But rationalism and empiricism alone are independent of God's authority. We don't need God telling us anything to do. And revelation doesn't reject logic and reason, but it says that God tells us some things that are the key to understanding everything. And so we must start with, uh, start with God. It is in his light that we see light. So last time, as we were coming to a close, I had gone to the situation in Eden, perfect environment. God created Adam and Eve together, male and female, in his image and likeness. They are perfect. They are created in his image, so therefore they are righteous. It's an untested righteousness, but it's not a neutral passive kind of righteousness. They are truly righteous. Whatever they do is going to conform to God's standard until they don't. So they are positively righteous and, and just as long as they are obedient to God. And so we see that God has created the human race in his image and in his likeness. And one of the aspects of that that image is self-determination. Now, they're limited in the extent of their self-determination and their will because they're creatures. They're not infinite. They don't have omnipotence and omniscience like God does. So they have, the, it's limited, but they can choose. They have that ability to decide whether they will willingly serve God or whether they will disobey God and not do what God says to do. God gave the man the ability to choose to determine his course because God did not want to be served by robots. He could have created robots who would just automatically do whatever God said to do, but he wanted sentient, that is thinking, conscious, individuals who willingly obeyed him, served him, and followed him because that was their choice. And so he created man with that ability to choose, and he created a test in the garden. And in all of God's creation, everything was said to be good. Now, what that means is it's all according to plan. The word good does not contain a moral idea although it doesn't say it's, there's immorality there. It's not focusing on that because God is righteous. Whatever he creates is, is going to be perfect. There was no sin. There's no corruption. There's no disease. There's no death. There's no poverty. There's no um, discord. There's no anger, resentment, bitterness. There is just loyalty towards God, love for one another, and it's a perfect environment. But then... There's a test, and that test consisted of one tree that God put in the middle of the garden. 
And he said, this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And before he'd created Eve, he told Adam, he said, you can eat from anything in the garden. I have created all these trees. Everything was beautiful, luscious fruit. Everything was just wonderful. The most beautiful, perfect environment. We can't imagine anything like it. And God said, but there's one tree here that you can't eat from. Now, I don't think that it looked any different. I don't, I don't think it looked dark. I don't think the leaves were black. I don't think there were any thorns. I know there weren't thorns. There's no thorns and thistles until after the fall. It looked like any other tree. The only difference is God said, don't eat from this tree. The day, the instant you eat from it, you, you're going to die. Now, they didn't know what death was. We're not sure. If, if, there's nothing in the text that indicates that God gave them a 10-series you know, lecture on what death was. But they knew it wasn't going to be a good thing. And we know from Scripture later that what death is, spiritual death, is it is alienation from God. We studied that in Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verses 17 and 18, that, that it's alienation from the life of God. So that was the test. And this is when we learn about the problem with the human race. And so there is one creature who is taken control of by, by Satan, and we learn that later. And this is the serpent. And the serpent is more cunning. He's subtle. He has a skill at being able to entice and deceive and twist uh, the truth. And so he uh, somehow inserts himself into the perfect garden, and he comes to the woman and he says, Notice what he's doing, the strategy. He's questioning God. Now, does he really have your best interests at heart? So, Did he really say this, that you shouldn't eat of, the, uh, of every tree of the garden? What's he keeping from you? And see, this is the basic strategy that Satan has had all through the centuries, is that somehow God doesn't want you to have fun. God doesn't really want you to enjoy the creation. God really doesn't want you to uh, have a happy life. He just has all these rules and regulations because he's trying to keep something for himself. And so this is going to be his basic argument. And so he starts with this very subtle question that plants a seed of doubt into the, uh, into the thinking of the woman. And verse 2, she says to the serpent, Well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it. She didn't stop there where she should have. Nor shall you touch it. God didn't say anything about touching it. Nor shall you touch it lest you die. And then what does the serpent say in verse 4? You shall not die. He directly contradicts God. First he plants doubt, then he directly contradicts God. This is how every false system of thought has been successful. It challenges the truthfulness of God. It challenges the righteousness of God because did God really say this? Is he really being fair to you? Is he really being just to you? So this, this idea of justice and righteousness isn't overtly mentioned, but it is, it's there. It's implied in the text. Is this really the right thing for you? You make the decision. So he's telling the creature now to make a decision to judge the goodness, the quality of the creator's command. Well, the, diff the problem here is the creator is omniscient. The creator knows everything. So the creator is also perfect. He's righteous and just. So the creator is going to make the right decision. And the creature has very limited knowledge. The creature ha is, has no idea uh, what else is going on around here. Uh, around this command, and so the creature has to decide whether God is really being just or fair. See, this is a problem. Remember this, when we come back and we're talking about the first divine institution in a couple of weeks, and we start getting into talking about this concept today that is challenging the very core of this whole foundation, and that is social justice. Because what social justice is challenging is God's system of righteousness and justice is false. It is the tool of Satan. It's the same lie. 
that God really doesn't want you to have what you should have and what you deserve. And that's his appeal to, to Eve. And we have to recognize that we constantly run into that even from our own sin nature. So God gave them the freedom to obey to obey him and to continue and develop the relationship with him, or they could choose to reject the knowledge and the limitations that God placed on them. So they could accept and continue in God's standards for right and wrong, and the only wrong was eating from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So they could choose to follow God or to disobey God and then face the consequences, face the penalty. And of course, Satan has said, oh, you won't die, it won't happen. And so that's what they're latching on to, that somehow he knows something that they don't know, and he knows that there won't be consequences. But what they did is they chose to act independently of God and to rebel against God's authority. When they said, okay, I'm going to eat it, they are not only disobeying God, they are rebelling against God's authority. They're no longer following it, and we're going to learn that that's a basic concept of sin. So this event, eating from the fruit, and one thing I want to say about this is eating the fruit, was, the fruit wasn't poisonous. The fruit wasn't something that was inherently bad. It didn't taste bad. It wasn't going to physically kill them. It was the act of disobedience that created the sin, not the fruit. The, the penalty wasn't physical death. The penalty is spiritual death. And it had awful consequences because it corrupted the soul. It, it corrupted the image of God. And so for all time, from that point on, every human being that has been born has born, been born in this state of sin because of their descent from Adam. Now, that might seem unfair to some, but if you learn some more about the Bible, you'll realize that because God created the human race as an organic whole, so that we're all related to one another, that the that the deed of one man affected all of us, but it made possible the reality that the deed of one other man could then be applied to all of us. That's why Jesus entered into human history and became a man so that as a man, he could die on the cross for us. There had to be that organic unity in the human race in order to do that. Have you noticed that angels don't get saved? Angels don't have an organic unity. Angels are created by God one at a time, so you can't have an angel that dies for all the others because there's no organic physical unity there for, for a Savior to die for, for all of them. But that's getting off into some, other, into some other issues. But from that time until the present, every human being is born with this uh, corrupted nature. Now remember, God provides a solution. God set up the situation because God is omniscient, and God is righteous, and God is just. So even when we think that God isn't, we have to remember who God is, that he defines things. He, he, he embodies the rules of the game, as it were, so that, we can't, uh, so that we can't make them up to fit whatever circumstances we want, because that was the essence of sin. And that's exactly what, what Eve tried to do, was to reshape the rules. Now, when we think about sin, that's a tough word for a lot of people because it's, it's been used wrongly by too many legalistic Christians on the one hand. And on the other hand, there have been, there have been those who have said, well, this is just an outdated, outmoded concept. It doesn't relate to us anymore. And there have been those who have defined sin as just really horrible, wicked, evil things. Oh, I'm not a sinner. I've never molested any children. I'm not a sinner. I've never abused a spouse. I'm not a sinner. I've never murdered anybody. And I remember when I was a kid... I was trying to witness to a brother and sister who lived down the street, and the sister was a smart mouth. And uh, she would say, well, you can't go to heaven if you've ever committed murder. Well, I was probably nine years old, so I had to go home to my mother and go, is that true? 
course, my mother said, well, no, because there were murderers in the Bible who were going to be in heaven like David, and she gave me a few others. And so that was my, I went back the next day, and I had an answer, and so that kind of thing went on and on. But sin isn't some super horrible thing. That's what a lot of people think, and they get offended if you say, well, you're a sinner. Well, I've never done anything bad. Well, you just did. You lied. You were arrogant. That's the sin. So there are two words that really help us understand what sin is, and I want to start with the English word. Do you know where the English word sin comes from? It comes from an old English word that would be pronounced the same, sin, S-Y-N-N-E. And it just meant that you did something wrong, a misdeed. We do things that are wrong. We make mistakes every day. And that was the root idea of that old English word. And that's sort of the root idea of the first word I have up here, the Hebrew word, which is chata, and it means to miss a target, to miss the mark, and it, it's the idea of you just making a mistake. It's like watching a professional uh, baseball team, and something happens, and you get uh, you, you, the batter hits a hits a grounder and it goes to shortstop and he fumbles the ball, drops it and picks it up again and it's an error. The word Hebrews Hebrew the word in Hebrew for that is a chata. You know it, he doesn't mean he even lost the game. He just he made a mistake. He missed the mark. He fell short of the standard that was necessary to to be able to uh, make the play. So chata has that idea. It's just missing the mark. It's failing to live up to the standard. What's the standard called? Righteousness. Okay? So falling short of righteousness is what sin is. It's you haven't been absolutely perfect. This is the idea behind Romans 3.23 which was known by everybody in the colonies. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God because nearly every kid that grew up in the colonies and learned their alphabet learned the basic uh, Puritan uh, little j jingles that went along with every letter of the alphabet. And the first letter in the alphabet was A, and they would all learn in Adam's fall, we sinned all. Everybody knew that without exception. And that was not up for debate. Everybody knew what sin was. But the, uh, a second word, there's three or four other words, but these are the top two, is pesha, which means, it's usually transla translated as transgression, which is a nebulous concept for most people. It means an act of rebellion or disobedience. Rebellion sounds really big, but it's just an act of disobedience. So... Um, you know, if we were one of those churches where I'd have everybody raise your hand when I said something, I'd say, how many people disobeyed their parents? Everybody's hand would go up. Or maybe we'd do it the other way. How many people never disobeyed their parents? All right. We've all sinned. We've all peshad. We've all committed a transgression. We've rebelled against our parents. We disobeyed them. That's what what Pesha means, that's a sin. So everybody's committed. They, we've missed the mark. We've fallen short of the the standard of God, his righteousness, and we have disobeyed him, and that's, uh, that's a transgression. It's very, very simple. So this was the origin of sin, and it's passed down through the generations, as we'll see in just a minute. This is how the Bible talks about sin, to understand it, and this applies to everybody. Jeremiah 17.9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? No one, you don't, know, you don't know your own heart. That's the implication here. You don't know your own heart, and when you are even deceiving yourself, and self-deception is part of arrogance. When we're all about us, we deceive ourselves into thinking that we, we know it all. Eve deceived herself in thinking, well, nothing's going to happen to me. Uh, I'll eat the fruit. It looks good. Nothing's going to happen. Uh, she she took the lie that Satan offered her, and she believed it, and so she was self-deceived. Psalm 14.1. Now, Jeremiah was written much later than Psalms. Jeremiah is written around the time of Israel's rebellion, about 600 B.C. So this, again, was known by everybody in the colonies, 
And that's why we call it a Judeo-Christian worldview is because they got their concepts from the Old Testament. They didn't probably know any Jews because there were only 2,000 Jews in the colonies at that time. But they knew the Old Testament. The heart is deceitful above all things. Psalm 14.1, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. They, that is the fool, those who deny God. It's not that you've actually articulated this in your mind, there is no God. The fool is saying, just like, like Eve did, uh, I'm not going to die. There's no God that's going to take care of this. Now, she, she wasn't denying the existence of God overtly, but she was acting as if God wasn't there. When we sin, we're acting as if God's not there and doesn't exist. So this is the implication of this. It's not talking about somebody who's an atheist. It is talking about somebody who, in their thinking, denies the reality of God's authority and God's judicial action in their life. They are corrupt. They've done abominable works. There is none, none. This goes beyond the fool. There's none who, ha who does good. This is repeated several times, Psalm 14, 3. They have all turned aside. They have, done, they have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. Now, that's pretty, pretty emphatic. None that does good. Now, you could stop there, and it would be, be stated that there's not one single human being that does good. But it goes on and says, no, there's not even one. There's no exception. It's, it's exceptionally emphatic. And then we look at Psalm 53, 3. Every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who, who does good. No, not one. So Psalm 14, 1, 14, 3, 53, 3, all say there is none who does good. Paul picks that up in Romans chapter 2. And he talks about the same. There is, he quotes them. There is none who does good. There is none who seeks after God. They are all turned aside. They are all corrupt. And Romans 3.23, which I mentioned already, for all have sinned. They've all missed the mark. That's the meaning of that word. It's a different word in the Greek, of course, but that's what it means. They've all missed the mark. That is, they've fallen short of the glory of God. And the glory of God is an idiom for the whole essence of God, all that makes God important, all of his attributes, they've fallen short of that. And this is true for everybody. Now, Adam sin, Eve sins, Adam sins. His is the determinative sin because he's the head of the human race. And then what happens to the image of God? Well, the image of God is not eradicated but the image of God is defaced, it is marred, it is corrupted, so that man has an orientation towards disobedience. And the next time we hear or read about the image, notice what is said in Genesis 5, 1 through 3. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. What that means is this is what happened to Adam's descendants. And the day that God, and it reminds us that God originally created Adam and Eve in God's image and likeness. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness. Okay, so you're in the image of God, but now his descendants are in his image, which is a fallen, corrupt, marred, defaced image. And so this is passed on from generation to generation. You read through Genesis 5, you get the whole list of the genealogy all the way down to the time of Noah. And then what does God think of the human race by that time? They've been just piling up sin after sin after sin, and now God gives them a real compliment. He said, the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and, the, and that every Every, not some, not most, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's a really strong statement. And the Lord was sorry. That's actually an anthropopathism that, that, to describe that God uh, mentally is saying that I should have done it differently or something like that. He's not really regretting it. He knows what his plan is, but it helps us understand that God 
God's righteousness is completely rejecting what the human race is doing. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And that's all anthropopathic language because we understand what that means, especially if you've had children who are rebellious. That, that, that communicates God's righteousness rejecting what man has done. And so we see this, it goes on, and of course God brings judgment on the earth. It's the worldwide flood, and this continues. The human race again and again, we have lots of examples as we go through Scripture of what happened because of man's rebellion. Now as we go through the rest of Genesis and we go through Exodus, and we go through, come to Joshua where the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob go into the land, they are to take control. God is going to use them to punish those who are living in the land. And so they are to defeat them and to completely destroy and annihilate them and take over the land. But they get all queasy about it. And rather than thinking in terms of God's righteousness and that the people who are there have been given 400 years by God to change their mind and to follow him, they, they, they compromise. And as a result of that compromise with the evil that is there, the evil of the Canaanites, the evil, all of the evil sins, the immorality, the sexual immorality, the perversions, the murders, all of these things that are going on in Canaan, they compromise with it. And by the, at the beginning of the book of Judges, everybody's doing well. They're trusting God. It's going to be a productive culture. By the end of the book of Judges, they're falling apart. They're worse than the Canaanites morally and ethically and judicially. They're just, they've destroyed themselves almost. And what's happened? What caused that? What caused it was that instead of obeying God, they're following in the pattern of Adam and Eve. Instead of obeying God, they disobey God and they rebel against him and they reject him. According to the Mosaic law that God had given them, God is the king. It was called the theocracy, rule by God. And so he ruled through the prophets, and he ruled through Moses, and he ruled through Joshua, and he would have ruled through others, but they rejected him. And so twice in Judges it says, in those days there was no king in Israel. That means they rejected God because God had not established a monarchy yet. That comes later. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So there's no king. There's no human government. And the divine government has been rejected. Once you reject God, you no longer have an ultimate reference point for right or wrong. You no longer have a basis for ethics. You no longer have a basis, basic for law. It all depends on your preferences. And that's the second line. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Pure moral relativism. And it ate away at the inside of the, of the culture of the Israelites and destroyed them. And they were falling apart by the end of the book of, of Judges. And so that's repeated twice. Now, the next thing is you go into 1 Samuel. And we'll t turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is one of the most important passages in the Bible that relates to government. And the founding fathers understood this. Last week I mentioned the study by Donald Lutz. And as he and his students over a 10-year period were analyzing over 15,000 writings by the founding fathers from 1760 to 1805, they were looking for the sources for their thinking, when they cited sources. So they cited some of the Enlightenment thinkers, as I pointed out last time, Locke, Montesquieu, Hume, others, and then they cited the Bible. They cited the Bible more than they cited any other single source. They cited the Bible more than all of the Enlightenment thinkers combined. All of the Enlightenment thinkers combined represented 21% of their citations. The Bible represented 33% of their citations. So don't ever tell, let people tell you that the Bible, uh, I mean, that the United States government 
the founding of this country was not based on the Bible. It's based on biblical thinking. Uh, Christianity, Judeo-Christianity, heavily influenced, to almost totally influenced, the thinking of the founding fathers. And so they went to the Bible, and Lutz and his uh, students listed all the different passages in the Old Testament and the New Testament that were cited. One of the passages that was cited more than any other is here in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now what happens, we're just going to hit the high points here, what happens is that Samson, uh, excuse me, Samuel has been a prophet and he is a judge and he has been uh, over representing God over Israel for most of his life, and now he is old. Who's going to succeed Samuel? Who will be the next judge? And the Israelites didn't want his boys to do that because they were disobedient. They were not wise. And verse 3 says, But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. See, they're no longer looking to God as the standard. Verse 4, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, which is where he lived, about 15 miles north of Jerusalem, and said to him, Look, you're old, and your sons don't walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. We want to be like everybody else. We need to have a human king. Now, God had already always intended for them to have a human king because there are stipulations about how the king should rule, what the king should do that's, that's found in Deuteronomy. But it wasn't ready yet. They're jumping the gun because they've rejected God's representative, and it's a time of the judges. They've rejected God as king. There's no king in Israel. So they say, we want to have a king like everybody else. So at this point, Samuel goes to the Lord, which is the right thing to do. And Samuel's not afraid to express his disgust at what has happened to the Lord and his resentment of what has happened to the Lord. See, so many Christians are afraid to tell God what they really think, and he knows what you really think, so quit trying to fool him. So Samuel just really, really complains to God, and the Lord says no. He says, heed the voice of your people. Listen to them. Because God, they meant it for evil, but God's going to turn it into good. And God says, listen to them and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. See, that helps us understand that those two verses back in Judges. They've rejected God's reign over them. That's what it meant. There's no king in the land of Israel. I didn't just make that up. So, then starting, uh, starting in verse 8, God tells him, this is what you're going to tell the people is going to happen. And this was a picture of tyranny. As you go through this, in the colonies, they're all thinking, yeah, that's what King George is doing. That's what England is doing. That, that's what's happened. We have a tyrannical king just like God outlines here. And in verse... Um, uh, 10, Samuel tells all the words of the Lord to the people who ask him for a king. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for your chariots and to be his horsemen, and some will run it before his chariots. In other words, he's going to treat your sons as if they're his slaves. They will be enslaved to the king. He's going to institute more than a draft. They, are, they belong to him. He will appoint captains over thousands, captains over fifties. He's going to organize the military. He's going to make sure that all the land is, uh, is, is plowed and harvested and planted. And he's going to make weapons of war and you're all, get you all into a big fight. He's going to take your daughters to work in his kitchens as perfumers, cooks, and bakers. And he'll take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves. You're going to all be turned into slaves and servants to the government. You're going to work on the government plantation. And you're going to be slaves to the government plantation. And he's going to take a tenth 
of your grain and your vintage. Now that's on top of the fact that God took two tithes every year and another tithe every third year, and now it's going to be another 10% on top of that. So basically the king is going to think that your money is his money. That's always the problem with the tyrannical government is taxation is legitimate, but they overtax because they think your money is their money and that your rights came from them and not from God. And that's why we had a war against and separated from England. Now let's get down to verse 20. We talked about this a little Tuesday night. This was a very important verse for the Founding Fathers because they recognize that it states the role and responsibilities of government. Uh, that our king may judge us. That is, the two responsibilities of government is to protect citizens from criminality, to give them a secure environment where they, their property is not going to be destroyed. And property is extremely important. Proper, we have the right to property. You go to the Ten Commandments, there's a command there, shalt, thou shalt not steal. And that means that you have a right to your property and nobody else does. You can't steal it. There's a right to private property and private ownership of property. And that almost exclusively destroys Marxism and socialism. People have a right to their own property and to do with it as they will. The government is to protect you so people do not destroy your property or take your property or steal from you. They are to protect you from criminality. The king may judge us. He's going to be, have courts to adjudicate problems between the citizens. And second, fight our battles. He's going to deal with external enemies. The enemies who wish to destroy us, take, oh, take, take us, take, steal our land. So the role of government is limited. It is to deal with criminality within the nation and uh, hostile enemies outside of the nation. Uh, you go back into uh, Leviticus there to guarantee a, a equitable weight and measures and standards of, of money and all of those things are all part of providing a stable economy for the citizens within, within the nation. So all of this is, is important. It sets the standard. And so when a nation lives according to that standard, they are righteous. We go back to a verse I quoted at the beginning, Proverbs 14.34 states, Righteousness exalts a nation... But sin is a reproach to any people. Now, this is what's called a, uh, a, a parallelism where the first line is the antonym or the opposite of the second line. Righteousness is aligning yourself with the standard of God's character. And when you do that, your nation will be exalted. It'll be lifted up. You'll be successful, prosperous, stable. There will be contentment because there is a, a, an equitable justice, and it's based on the character of God and God's revelation. You have to remember that after, after Deuteronomy and after Leviticus, those are, that's where you have the law given in Exodus and Leviticus, and then you have the law sort of summarized and restated in Deuteronomy. After that... Whenever you read these terms righteousness as an expectation on the people, the standard that is referred to there is the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law is the legal, civil, and ceremonial law code that God gave so it is consistent with his character. Doesn't mean that's the only way that these uh, civil and criminal codes could, could be stated, but it, it becomes an example for, it's to be an example for other countries. So God's standard, following God's standard, that's another way, say, another way of saying righteousness, that exalts a nation, but sin, that is falling short of that standard, is a reproach or it's shameful to any people. Now think about that. Now, you th have you ever read that verse or heard that verse before, other than me? Pay attention to that verse. You know, this was the most popular verse to be quoted by politicians and preachers in the colonial period. 
nobody didn't know this verse. Everybody knew it. Everybody had heard it many, many, many times. In fact, if you go through the records of the founding fathers, almost every one of them mentions this verse multiple times. They understood that they had to have a legal code governing the nation that promoted the righteousness of God. They understood that the greatness of a nation wasn't in its prosperity, it wasn't in its productivity, it wasn't in the number of people, it was in its morality and its righteousness. They understood that the greatness of America did not lie in her industry or creativity or productivity or intelligence or wealth, but in her character, in her morality. That's what they understood. And they also understood that once that was lost, the nation would self-destruct. Proverbs 11:10 through 12 was also frequently cited. When it goes well with the righteous, that is those who are living according to the standard of God, the city rejoices. Why? Because they're not involved in legalism on the one hand or antinomianism on the other hand. There's, there's, there's stability. There, there is a limit on criminality. People have safety. People have security. They can walk the streets any time of day and not be afraid of getting mugged, not be afraid of being attacked. Their property is going to be secure. Nobody's going to be breaking into their property. When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. They're happy. They, th things are going well for them. And when the wicked perish, because there's always wicked people, there's jubilation. You know, in a biblical economy, when the wicked die, the righteous rejoice. We live in a world, oh, no, no, we're, you know, never speak ill of the dead. I don't think you see that in the Bible. Um, by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. That repeats that first line in verse 10. But it is overthrown. That is, the city is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. Sins of the tongue. When you have a press that continue to libels the president and slanders the president, when you have people who can get on the media at night and tell all kinds of lies and print books that have all kinds of lies in them, that is the mouth of the wicked. And that will destroy a nation because there's nobody standing up and saying, you can't do that, you can't lie, I'm not going to print it. Because oh, I'll make so much money when they print that. Oh, I, I'm going to print it. I don't care if it's true or not. There's no ethic, there's no quality of character in those people, in the wicked. He who is devoid of wisdom despises his neighbor. So the fool despises his neighbor. You're not trying to protect your neighbor. You think about some of these riots we've seen. How many people are down there protecting the property of their neighbors? I have read an account recently of what was transpiring in the, in the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles back in 92. And one of the things that there were a lot of Korean shop owners in there. And these Koreans, would sit, the shop owners, would sit back in a dark corner with their shotgun in their lap. Somebody would break in the front door and they'd blow them away. And pretty soon, nobody was trying to break into the Korean shops. That's what you have to do. Uh, you're protecting yourself, and in such, you're protecting others. He who is devoid of wisdom despises his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his peace. He's not going to be slandering his neighbor. He's showing love and respect for his neighbor. Now, one other key verse I want to look at was a verse that was one of George Washington's favorites. I think I'm going to stop here and come back to it next time because it's, it lays the groundwork for a few other passages that we're going to look at. This was quoted again and again by George Washington. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? 
th this verse and others like it are embedded in the thinking of the founding fathers. We don't have leaders like this anymore. And if we do, and I think there's some, even in Washington, who think this way, they are shunned, they are set aside, they are overlooked, they're not put on critical committee assignments, they're not given positions of responsibility and authority. And I have, t I have talked to and I have heard uh, numerous solid believers who have gone to Washington and they have said, Pray for us, pray for me every single day. You cannot even imagine the pressure to, to compromise, the temptations, uh, the attacks, everything that, that's there. And we need to pray for our leaders and their understanding of the truth and those that are believers that they will stand firm on the basis of God's, God's word. So we'll come back and start here next time and then work our way out and do a summary of the importance of, of worldview. That's the first part of this series. And then following that, we'll get into the second part, which is on the divine institutions, which are the social laws that God built into creation, built into the fabric of the human soul, so that when they are followed, then the sin nature can be restrained and there can be peace and stability in a nation. But when they're not followed, then everything falls apart and you end up destroying a nation and destroying a culture and destroying a people. Father, thank you for your grace, for your goodness, for giving us your word. We know there is hope. We look out, we hear all this horrible stuff on the news all the time. It's discouraging. We can get depressed. We can get our eyes on the wrong thing. But Father, we know that you are in control and we know that you are working to bring about a certain end as a result of this. And Father, we pray that we might not be discouraged and, and depressed by it, but that we might be able to focus on the fact that this is your will. How can we use this to communicate the gospel? How can we use this to be a witness for you? How can we use this to be an example of your righteousness and your truth, uh, no matter what happens? Help us to think about what consequences might come, worst case scenarios, best case scenarios, and to always be praying for our president, for all of those who represent us in Congress, and for all of those who serve us in the, in the uh, city councils, in the county government. There are some very godly, strong believers serving in some of these positions. And they are surrounded by people who, who hate them and want to destroy them. We pray that you'd strengthen them. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.